are you new to welding? Check out this video. This whole video is about welding joints, terms, nomenclature, temperatures, a lot of basics. You know this stuff, it's going to help you become a better welder in the long term, even in the short term. Just understanding these basics is going to make you overall a better welder. Check it out. So, here we're going to take a look at the five basic weld joints that are divided into two groups. So pretty much everything that is welded out there is either T, lap, corner, edge, or butt weld. There's some differences that can go with those. You know, you can weld two pipes together and that would still be a butt weld, but it's obviously uh, round or maybe some tubular, a square tube uh, tubing. That could be a butt weld. Uh, it could be a fillet weld. So you got plate and then you got a tube that's going to be uh, welded together. Uh, that could be a T. So it really just depends. Uh, but when you really break it down, we got about five main weld joints. You got to know that T lap corner, edge, butt. With that being said, it's worth mentioning that an edge is not that common. Okay. T's, laps, really common types of fillets. Corners are out there. Absolutely. Um, but like when it comes to groove welds, butt is going to definitely be way more popular than an edge weld. This, we got a fillet and we got a groove weld. So when you think of a fillet, think of something triangular. So if we're going to go ahead and weld here, we're going to fill out this little triangular cross section. Same thing here, triangular cross section. I, the T doesn't have to be a perfect 90 you know, can we have a T that has acute and obtuse angle? Absolutely. Okay, but it's still a type of triangle. So you got obtuse, acute angles, doesn't matter. It's still a T. Okay, so T, lap, corner are all fillet welds because they have some type of triangular weld mint. When you like, if you were to cut it open, look at the cross section. Uh, when you think of groove, think of side by side. Okay, so you got edge welds and butt welds. Okay, so fillet groove. Also, when you get into learning the positions, this video is not about the positions, but when you learn about those, remember F and G. F for fillet, G for groove. All right, a couple other important things. We have types of welds. They can be fused together basically one of two ways. Autogenous or with filler okay most people think of a weld with some type of filler you see a bead you see something that's in addition to the base metal but it's not the the end all be all there are autogenous welds autogenous is a fusion of the base metal only so i tried to draw something here I, i'm showing this is red like an extra material but the same color here basically i'm taking maybe a tig torch or an oxy acetylene torch or plasma arc welding those would work uh, there's other methods out there uh, not all methods allow you to do autogenous you cannot autogenous stick weld or autogenous flux core weld or autogenous mig those have to use a wire but for a few of them you definitely can do this uh, lasers and tig and all that but it's basically just fusing what is already there okay i want you to keep in mind though the filler metal is what usually makes a weld even stronger or the actual whole component stronger. So let's say we're actually using an A36 steel. Well, the minimum tensile strength is 36,000 pounds. But say we stick weld this with a 7018. Well, now we're talking about 70,000 pounds tensile strength minimum yield. As long as it's done correctly, that weld is way stronger than the base metal, okay? To continue, we have either single pass welds or multi pass welds. It depends on what industry you get into. Uh, if it's a single pass or multi pass, people doing sheet metal work probably are gonna do a lot of single pass welds, okay? You get into the, uh, I don't know, big industrial work such as uh, iron worker or pipe fitter or something like that. They're probably going to deal with multi-pass welds, okay? They got a root, they got fill, they got cap, okay? The cap could be one bead, the cap could be three beads, five beads, ten beads. It doesn't really matter. 
but just know that there are single pass welds and multi pass welds. Another thing worth mentioning on this is that this butt weld here, which is a groove weld, you know, I'm showing a bead on this side. So we could have it a single pass on each side, but it's still a single pass. So there's two beads, but it's still a single pass. You know, welding both sides is a joint. I only showed one here. Obviously, you weld both sides. It's definitely going to be stronger than welding one side. But is it necessary? I will say of uh, all the years that I've been in this, I noticed that a lot of things are over-welded, over-engineered. They're just putting way too much metal down for what the purpose is. It's a waste of metal, waste of time, and it's costly. Next thing is uh, just understanding uh, the parts of a weld and, uh, you know, what uh, order they come in and things like that. So here's an example of just starting up here, a T, which we know is a fillet. And a lot of times when I demonstrate this, I will put a tack on both sides. Okay, so just toss a tack on both sides. You could put tacks in here. It doesn't really matter. Um, but now I don't have to worry about welding over a tack, okay? I can make that tack autogenous if I'm TIG welding, but I would, you know, have to put some filler metal down if I'm stick welding, okay? So a tack is there to hold the pieces together temporarily uh, well or before the actual uh, weldment is made, okay? Here we're looking at a giant, what looks like a V-groove uh, butt weld. Okay, so we stick them together. It looks like we made a pass. Our first pass, we're going to weld uh, from the top down. So it looks like we're welding this way, maybe. And we get some penetration in there. And we get our first pass, which we call our root pass. Root pass, we want to make sure we get good fusion. And uh, we don't want to, uh, you know, have any impurities or anything like that. I want to mention this now, though. Everybody assumes 100% penetration is the end-all, be-all of welding. That is not true at all. Actually, there are so many weldments out there where just a little bit of penetration is good enough for uh, the purpose of whatever the weldment is. It doesn't have to be uh, super strong and, uh, you know, all the way through and, and things like that. You know, you talk about pressure vessels and steam pipe. Yeah, that definitely needs to have 100% penetration, no impurities and all that. But there's a lot of welds of just everyday products that we don't even realize. They're just slightly cutting into the metal, okay? So instead of this going all the way down, you know, rather we see something that would look maybe like here's two pieces and I'll use the same color, and there's our weld, okay? You can see it's not welded all the way down and through, and just a little bit here, it's going to hold it together. You'd be surprised. Or even if we just did this, go ahead, run a bead on both sides of a piece of metal like that and try to break it. It's not easy, okay? Uh, to continue, next pass, sometimes they refer to it as the hot pass or cushion pass, uh, you don't have to call it a hot or cushion pass. It really still is considered part of the intermediate passes. So anything between the root and the cap or cover are considered intermediate passes. But sometimes people like to call that the hot pass, cushion pass, whatever. These we're calling the fill intermediate. And then this top layer is our cover cap. Okay. If this is a critical weld, chances are the root is going to be inspected. The, the intermediate passes are going to be inspected and your cover pass is going to be inspected. It could be just a visual test or maybe it's some type of uh, non-destructive testing like an x-ray or uh, mag particle or something else. There's a lot of options out there, okay? Uh, I tried to highlight this here just outside the weld zone. So this was all, you know, there's base metal fusion here. So it melted and re-solidified. And then all through here, that's all considered the heat affected zone. So you're actually changing the chemical properties. You're actually changing the internal uh, crystallization of the actual steel. That gets into metallurgy and whatnot. But it's also important to understand, hey, heat affected zone for, for future uh, purposes. Okay. And then we have uh, base metal. Okay. So I, you'll start to see in my videos, uh, BM base metal. Groove weld. Okay, so we're going to specifically look at the parts of a groove weld. 
So I drew this as a V groove uh, with a little bit of a root face here. Okay, so uh, two pieces, and I show it as one big bead, whether it be, you know, one bead or several, maybe a root, a fill, a cap, whatever it might be, it doesn't matter. Uh, these all can apply, okay? So this one, let's just say, hey, we got one big bead. First thing, we'll start at the top. We got welding toes, okay? So the toes are the edges of a bead. So let's just say we decide, okay, we're going to run a bead here. Just on this piece of metal. We're learning. And this edge and this edge are the welding toes. And you'll hear us say, let the toes tie in. You want to make sure they tie in. We are not looking for beads that look like like this where they kind of just sit at the top of the actual metal it looks like it's just kind of like a lump there sitting on there we want to make sure everything ties in we can do that by technique and we can do that by uh, settings as well so we got to make sure we have the proper amperage and, and everything else okay uh, let's continue on with the weld face which is the area that is between the two toes okay so you have toe toe faces between it okay when we talk about groove welds we don't say convex or concave uh, we say we want something at least flush with some reinforcement okay you're not going to find somebody that says okay go ahead and and purchase this half inch metal and then weld uh, just below flush why did you order a half inch metal if you're just below flush? That doesn't make any sense. So we don't do concave or underfilled. We look for welds that are flush to slightly uh, reinforced, okay? So since this is on the top and we're, we're talking about welding top down for this example with one bead, uh, this would be considered the face reinforcement, okay? So we have both face reinforcement and root reinforcement. You can call them both reinforcement if you want to separate them root and face, fine. Okay, uh, both serving the, the same purpose. A little extra metal there is a good thing. We want to build up some strength, okay? And then you can actually uh, have too much, you know, build up for your reinforcement. And our code books actually do tell us that. Okay, when we continue to look at the actual uh, part itself, we... Probably had some square metal, okay, it was square, and then we used some type of uh, mechanical or thermal cutting process to create a bevel, and this bevel may have been all the way down to a point, and this one as well, down to a point. We call that knife edge or a feather edge, okay, either way it works, uh, if we want to actually have a root face in there as you can see here this is a root face or a land either way both of those work one is really a AWS word one is an API word it doesn't matter uh, so we have uh, a root face we could just grind these in okay so use a grinder uh, some of the nibblers out there will actually cut this perfect with with the, the root face in there it's just the depth at which it gets cut but um, that's for a, a different video anyways and then the last thing I have in here, I believe, is the uh, root opening or gap. Again, two, two words that you'll hear. And, you know, we'll use uh, bigger root openings for more aggressive processes. So maybe a stick weld, we would use an eighth-inch root opening with an eighth-inch rod. Whereas uh, MIG welding, maybe we'd use a sixteenth to a 332 root opening because uh, short-circuit MIG welding's uh, rather cold compared to you know running a eighth inch sixty ten in a root like that okay but that also goes the with with the same thing with these uh, root face the the larger the root face so if we keep cutting it straight up uh, we're going to create uh, a larger root face which is kind of more meat there to take on the heat the intense heat of the welding arc the rest of this is considered your root face. And then those are usually cut at certain angles uh, based on, I don't know, whatever the qualification test is or, or well, maybe you're just cutting it uh, at a 45 just to do it. Who knows, okay? Next one is a fillet weld. 
Okay, so we're looking at fillet welds. We talked about the triangle. And uh, again, let's start up here. Weld toes. Toe one, toe two. Toes should tie in. Okay, that's usually where we find undercut. We don't want to find undercut, okay? Uh, we also don't want cold lapping where it kind of looks like it just sits on the actual metal. Uh, sometimes that happens with your colder processes such as like short circuit MIG welding. They're going way too slow. The settings are too slow. It's not really tying in. It's kind of just building up at the toe, okay? Uh, weld face in between. This is where we can talk about our contour being convex, concave, or flat. We usually say flat to slightly convex is the most desired contour. So what we have here is fine. We could have it straight across too. That's that's good. Flat is good. A little con, uh, convexity is okay. But a lot of buildup out here we call the convexity. That's too much. We don't want that. It's a waste of metal, waste of time. And it actually could have negative stresses on it. Same thing goes for uh, a concavity where, you know, the bee just kind of comes down like this. And that can possibly lead to uh, cracks at the toe. So we don't want that either. Okay. Uh, so we got weld toes, uh, weld face. Now we have weld legs. So what is the distance from this edge out to this toe? Okay. And then also applies this base metal here out to this toe. Okay. So those are weld legs. The more advanced classes we teach, we tell them, hey, we want a 10 pass and it's got to be exactly half inch or whatever it is that we're looking for. Uh, so we want to make sure that you can make uh, either equal legs or unequal legs properly by stacking metal the right way. Okay, we have the uh, weld root down in here. You can see our base metal and we have some penetration. That's good. That's what we want. Okay, and then when we talk about the throat, uh, we actually have three throats. Actual throat, effective throat, theoretical throat. So just because my drawing is probably not the best, I'm going to actually point these out. The actual throat all the way out here to wherever the penetration, um, you know, burns into. Then we have our effective throat, which is kind of just taking that toe, putting a line right through it, because this isn't really going to add a whole lot. And then this is going to take us down to the uh, penetration. And then the theoretical throat is really this point to that straight line going across. Okay? Uh, you get more into the welding inspection side, you can, you can talk about actual effective and theoretical throat. But overall, for, for most of our classes, just say, from the outside here right into this root, there's your throat. Okay? All right, this is just breaking down uh, the process a little bit more. This is actually stick welding. Uh, I have my electrode filler rod. It's on an angle in the direction I'm going. Okay, I put a little tip here. When there is slag, you drag. So that could apply to flux core arc welding and uh, stick welding. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. So if you're going to do like a vertical up, you're not going to drag it up. You're actually going to kind of encourage it to go up. So you're actually going to tip it forward. Uh, so you're almost pushing it rather than uh, dragging it. Okay. And then TIG, you're, you're going to push. You're not going to do a drag angle. Um, and uh, MIG, well, that can go both ways. We can do a, a push-pull or perpendicular. And that's also in one of the other videos so direction of welding, you can see we're going this way. You can see our ripples behind us there. We have our arc, okay? That arc, that distance between the burning end of the rod down to the base metal, uh, electricity is flowing through that gap and it hates every bit of it. So those electrons are upset, which creates a extremely hot arc. That's what allows us to melt metal, okay? So that arc length is very important. The uh, weld puddle or pool, you can, you know, interchangeable words there. Uh, we'll tell you, you read the puddle, it tells you everything. I don't care what the process is. Stick, MIG, TIG, flux, core, plasma, arc, welding. I don't care. Oxy fuel. Read the puddle, it tells you everything. That is definitely a true statement. The longer you're in this, the more you'll understand that that is true. 
Uh, we got some spatter going on here. We usually get spatter in about all processes except for TIG, all of our major processes except for TIG. If you got spatter, we got an issue. Let's fix it, okay? We don't want excessive spatter. Yeah, we can have uh, excessive spatter with MIG. That's not good. We should probably fix that. There should be some things flying around, but, but not too crazy. Here's our weld bead. You can see our depth of penetration. How much are we burning into this base metal, okay? We got our arc length, and our arc length should be about one rod diameter depending on the process, but that usually works out pretty good. I'd say your TIG welding, you got an eighth inch uh, tungsten electrode. If you're an eighth inch off, I think you'll be all right. You might want to be a little closer. That's kind of preference or not. Um, I like to run mine as close as possible. Stick, same thing, eighth inch rod, about an eighth inch distance. Um, and then the wire for flux core and MIG, that's, that's a little bit different. So we're not going to discuss that. That's all based on voltage. Here we have our travel angle, okay? Travel angle and travel uh, and work angle are two different things. Uh, I can't really show in this picture what work angle is, uh, but it would be the perpendicular angle to this. So uh, it looks like maybe I'm hitting it at a 90, but you can't see that, but that's okay. Uh, so we have a, a travel angle and maybe we are about, uh, I don't know, 10 degrees, 15 degrees off of that 90, and that works great for a lot of your stick welding. This is the plume, this smoke coming up. Smoke, plume, interchangeable, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. Keep your face out of the plume, okay? Don't breathe that stuff in. It's not good for anybody. All right, in this uh, last little page, uh, we are talking about welding temperatures. Temperatures that I think students should know, okay? Anybody that's learning welding. If you understand the, the melting temperatures of different metals and the arcs that are created with these different processes, it's going to make you a better welder because it's going to make you think about, hey, am I going to burn through or not, or do I want to have more penetration, whatever it is. Uh, understand this, okay? Base metal temperature uh, for steel, it's about 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're going to say approximate on all of these, okay? It changes with the amount of carbon content. So it actually drops, it gets a little bit lower as more carbon gets introduced. We're welding on typically low carbon steel, so we'll say approximately 2,800 degrees. Keep that in mind when we talk about our arc temperatures, okay? Stainless is slightly lower than steel, but it is, it's too similar to, to notice a difference, okay? I gotta fix that. Uh, but it is uh, very similar to steel. Uh, if anything, I could say over time, I've noticed that steel or stainless steel looks a little bit more fluid, and that's really because of the nickel chromium in there. So it's, it's on shinier metal. It, it all probably plays into it, but it runs very similar. Okay, aluminum is kind of the oddball. Aluminum is approximately 1,200 degrees. And you think, well, wow, that's crazy because I put a ton of heat, put my AC on 180, and I have a hard time really getting a great puddle or whatever. Uh, you know, that's not the problem. The problem is the oxidation layer. So there's this micro layer around the B or the, the metal, base metal, and it's because of the chemistry of aluminum and the fact that oxygen is able to uh, grab onto that, uh, that shell around the actual uh, atom, and it creates this really strong, almost unbreakable uh, oxidation layer. Luckily, our machines are so strong that we can uh, break up this oxidation layer. There's a whole video on that. That's AC. You got positive and negative. The positive is the cleaning action. But just keep in mind, 3,600 degrees that blast through that layer as opposed to the aluminum under, which is about 1,200. Okay? Uh, worth mentioning early on in our classes, tungsten melts around 6,200 degrees Fahrenheit. That makes it an excellent electrode. All right, to continue on. The arc for most manual and semi-automatic processes is probably somewhere between about 6,000 and 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It could be a little more, it could be a little less, but it's hot, okay? So we're talking six to 10,000 degree arc right here. We're not gonna have a problem melting steel, which melts at 2,800 degrees. It's almost instantaneous. We strike an arc and it is melting that base metal, okay? Plasma cutting, this is just cool to know. 
could be anywhere from like 20 to 40,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Depends on the, the actual plasma cutting machine, how many amps we're running it at. Uh, there are different types of gases that you can run. Uh, most of the time, a lot of people are just using plasma uh, with compressed air. So compressed air makes the plasma, and compressed air actually shields the plasma. Okay, um, And then the last one, oxyacetylene welding and cutting. I chose oxyacetylene. Uh, there's propylene, there's propane, there's MAP, there's all kinds of different gases out there. Uh, but I just wanted to mention 5,800 degrees Fahrenheit for a neutral flame. It's got to be a neutral flame. It's nearly 6,000 degrees. And we still teach acetylene cutting and welding. And worth uh, mentioning acetylene is it is like the oldest gas used for oxy fuel welding and cutting. It is still burning the hottest by far. It does not have the highest BTU rate, but the actual temperature of the flame is, is super high. Uh, so that wraps up the basics. This stuff is important to know. Think about it when you're welding and how it can affect everything you're doing. Understand the, 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 the weld mints you're making, the temperatures, the parts of the weld, and uh, it's going to help you just be a better welder.